You've probably heard it said, if we don't know our history, then we're bound to repeat it. Sometimes the only way to move forward is to understand where we've been. And that's so important for the church as God has given us the responsibility to bring in the harvest of souls. So stay tuned for this very important message on Abundant Harvest as Arkansas Live starts right now. Thank you again for joining us for this edition of Arkansas Live. All week we've been talking about the Abundant Harvest prophecy through uh, Kenneth Copeland said that 219 is going to be the year of abundant harvest. Now, if you watch this, is if it ever appears as a re-air, you can apply these same principles. Uh, but this year, we believe that this is going to be an abundant harvest year. Now, as I said before, and I repeat it, sometimes people hear those prophecies and they think dollar signs, abundant harvest. Oh, goody, I'm going to get rich. All my money's going to come. Well, it certainly includes finances. But as I was meditating on this, the Holy Spirit led me in a general direction of the harvest of souls, an awakening, an abundant harvest. And I started the week with letting you see in the Bible where Jesus addressed the disciples about an abundant harvest, a plenteous harvest, a great harvest, a ripe harvest, a white harvest, all referring to abundance. It's excessive. So I believe we're going to see more people come into the kingdom than ever before. Now, that certainly takes money. So we're going to have to include the abundant harvest of finances. But I want to emphasize the part about the souls, about the people. And uh, there has to be a compassion, a love for the lost, just like Jesus had compassion for the leper and for the multitudes that were weary and tired and he preached the gospel of the kingdom to them. I, I guess what I want us to get out of this as we move into uh, another year, I, I, I want us to regain, and we're going to read this out of Revelation, I want us to regain or refire our first love. You know, Jesus told the church at Ephesus in the letters to the seven churches in Asia, he said, you've left your first love. I want us to get back to our first love. I want us to get back to the, the expectation of winning people to the Lord, of loving people, uh, not willing that any should perish. No person die or go to hell. We should constantly be reminded of reaching the people you know, for the kingdom of God. Now, today, I, I, I connect with where we started yesterday or where we finished yesterday, looking backward to see the way forward. And uh, I read you Deuteronomy 32, 7. Um, and then also I quoted to you what President Woodrow Wilson said one time, a nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today nor what it is trying to do. And I think sometimes that's applicable to where we are today in America. The reason some say we've lost our way is because we have forgotten where we came from. Statements like we're no longer a Christian nation. That's, that's, a, that's not true. And whatever we once were, well, what we once were, we still are. According to the founders, according to the Constitution, according to all of this, uh, the founders of this nation. We were a godly nation. The Bible says that our documents were founded for a Christian people and that you cannot interpret these documents that were wit written for a Christian nation. So we, were, we are a Christian nation by founding, by our founders. But what we've done is we've forgotten what we were. And you have to look back to see the way forward. An example before we go on. I've forgotten what year it was, but uh, I, was, uh, I was serving as the president of ICFM, International Convention of Faith Ministries. I was, I was serving as president, and I served for 12 years. This was an organization for relatively uh, known uh, faith churches in, in America and around the world. We had 
We had members all over the world. We had conferences all over the world in Singapore and London and Africa and you name it where we had members. And it was an organization started basically by those of us in the faith community. We wanted an organization that we could all belong to that was bigger than our own respective ministries. And there were many times where there were power struggles, at least in the 12 years that I served as a president. It's, it's still going on today. It's 35, 40 years old now. And <clears throat> I, I remember struggles where there were ministers that were power hungry. They wanted to use the organization for their own personal benefit. I had, in fact, I had somebody tell me, why don't you use ICFM for your own ministry springboard. I mean, you can preach in all these churches. I said, that's not what my job is. My job was not to use the organization for my personal good. My job was to hold fast the vision of the founders. That's what my job was. My job was to keep the organization headed in the right direction in the vision of the founders. And that's what I did for 12 years was hold it on the vision, to hold it on path, hold it on uh, the right trail in the middle of the road. Well, that's what, you know, our job uh, as church people, believers, we're, we're still, like Jesus said, I'm doing the work of the Father. Our job is to continue doing the work of the ministry. It's his ministry. It's Jesus' ministry. And we're the under shepherds and we're keeping it in line with the scriptures. And we see so many departures, so many rabbit trails, so many deceptions and, and people going off on this tangent and on this tangent. I'm so thankful that I've seen all of this over the years. I've seen tangent after tangent. I've seen fads, doctrinal fads, winds of doctrine, blow through, blow. And if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in that. You'll, you'll set your sail and you, oh, that's wrong. I'm going to attack that. And you spend all of your time attacking uh, what's wrong and then you get off. You forget what your assignment was, what your mission was. Well, the church has to stay focused. The, you know, <laughs> for those ministers, I know, I know the Bible teaches us in Jude to contend for the faith, but it doesn't say defend the faith. Johnny Carson asked Catherine Kuhlman one time to appear on his uh, nighttime program, The Tonight Show, and to defend her ministry. She said, I won't be coming. I, God's word need no defense. You don't have to defend it, but you are to contend for it. In other words, you keep preaching it. But the moment you start trying to defend yourself against any false doctrine or whatever, then you get in the ditch with the people you're, you're contending against, if you know what I'm trying to say. So I see so many times people get off in a tangent of trying to prove this wrong that they get so um, caught up in it that they, they, they're, Satan does this on purpose. If you've ever had this problem, he, he does it to get you off your message. You don't have to prove everybody wrong. Now you teach your message so people will have the truth. The knowledge of the truth is what makes people free, but there's no such ministry as the gift of straightening people out. So you don't have to, you don't have to expose every error. You just keep teaching the truth. The error will self-destruct eventually. Uh, and every, every wind of doctrine that I've ever seen go through, they were all based on biblical truths, but they were excessive. They were extreme and they got off and they eventually sputtered out. Deliverance submission, um, discipleship, intercession, um, salvation. There are many different false um, biblical doctrines about salvation. Grace that's going on right now. All kinds of things uh, that uh, Judaism, 
he break roots. There's biblical truths. There's, there's Bible precedent for all of these things. But when you push it to the extreme, you know, if, you, if you're going to tell me that uh, the woman with the issue of blood was healed because she touched Jesus' uh, prayer shawl, the tallits, if you're going to tell me that the girl that he raised from the dead uh, was raised from the dead because he covered her with a prayer shawl, and then at the end of your program, you're going to sell me your prayer shawl? the Bible doesn't say any of that. Jesus told the woman that it was her faith that made her whole. Uh, the little girl that arose, there's no evidence that there was even a prayer shawl. People are assuming that Jesus, because he was called rabbi, that he wore a prayer shawl everywhere he went, uh, and they're selling prayer shawls. So, you know, give me a break here. It's not the prayer shawl that healed them. It was the anointing that healed them. It was their faith that healed them. But if I'm selling you prayer shawls, I have to, I have to make that prayer shawl mean something to you. Now, these are, this is not to, to be a criticism. It's just explaining to you, if you spend all your time on the defense, you miss the whole point. Uh, the, the gospel is not defensive. The gospel is offensive. Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and defend the gospel. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So don't get upset. Relax. You get too intense and you're going to hurt yourself. Continue to teach and preach the truth. Model it. People will eventually see the difference and they'll appreciate the stability because anybody can get off. Anybody can take a side trip. You just have to examine yourself. Okay, what's moving me? What's motivating me? Well, I'm going to prove them wrong. That's the wrong motivation. So we have to remember the days of old, looking backward to see the way forward. I'm so appreciative of all the history and all the experience that I've had in days past. The men and women that I've known, their ministries were solid and stable. Well, they're all gone now. I traveled with them. I preached with them. I stayed in their homes. I knew them. And now it's my generation's responsibility to continue maintaining those uh, truths and continuing to move forward. Let's go over to Isaiah 46 as we continue to establish this. Uh, Isaiah 46, and let's see, yeah, Isaiah 46 and verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasures. There are still some things that we haven't seen yet, but God has declared the end from the beginning. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done. So there are some things in, in the past that we haven't even seen yet. Go to Isaiah 48, verse 3. I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. Things that are in the past are important. No, we don't live in the past. We live in the present, but we look to the future and the things in the days of old. We should consider the generations uh, long past. Okay, let's go to the next topic. Go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, and let's look at verse 18. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now I wrote this down. Keep the main thing the main thing. You've probably heard it before. 
keeping the main thing the main thing. When I was in the Navy, in the military, and I served a total of six years, two years at sea, two years reserve, two years inactive. But the Navy boot camp instilled in us that we were to always obey our last order first. Now, if you served in the military, maybe you were taught and trained the same way. You always obey your last order first. Now, of course, in the Navy, they had a saying, you do things, there are three ways to do things, the right way, the wrong way, and the Navy way. So you might as well do it the Navy way first because you have to do it over again. Always keep your last order first. Well, what was the last commandment, the last order that Jesus gave us? Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. That was the last thing he said. You can read it in Mark 16 also, the Great Commission. Um, he said at verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was his last order. He, that has not been rescinded. That has not been preempted. That has not been covered with another order. That's everything that he did to prepare the disciples when he told them to go wait in the upper room till they were endued with power. The Holy Ghost came upon them. They were empowered to be a witness unto him to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, you know, sometimes people separate this last order, um, keeping the main thing the main thing. Matthew 24 says, uh, in the, referring to the second coming of Christ, he said the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the world, then the end shall come. So he reminds us that the end is not going to come until all these things have been fulfilled. The gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to the world. Then the end shall come. But some have separated this, this, this main thing and put it over in a category of missions. And they call it missions. I mean, in our church, we had a missionary department. I had a staff minister over missions. And if you're not careful, you will see missions as a separate function of the church. And yet missions is the function of the church. <laughs> I, 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 see if I can explain it this way. What we do is we, we build a building and we start a church and here's the church. And then we add to it missions. The mission, the mission is the church. The church is the mission. The, the church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have missionary offerings. We have Mission Sunday. We have things that pertain to missions. And I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize or anything. I'm just trying to show you we need to remember the main thing is the main thing. Everything that we do is part of the Great Commission. Mission. Missionary apostle sent one. Well, Ecclesia, the church, sent ones, called out ones. We're all a part of the Great Commission. We're all called to do this. Keep the main thing the main thing. The, the last mandate that Jesus gave his disciples was to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching, training, preparing, equipping. What happened to the church? Why isn't the church doing this? You know, in, in some circles, the missions um, uh, was just an outreach of the church. The, the mission to go to all the world is the church. That is the mission. Some people feel called. Some people uh, sinned. Some people just went. Some people just sent. And back in the day, in previous generations, they just, you know, different attitudes, different thoughts, missionaries are people that couldn't make it in the, in the ministry in America, so they went to a third world country. They were rock stars over there, heroes over there in third world countries, but here uh, they didn't have any reputation. And then some churches uh, saw missionaries, they sent them their used clothes and uh, their hand-me-downs and, you know, 
secondary ministers. Wrong. This is, this is all the, the mission of the church. Okay. What happened to the church? Now, there's no doubt, there's, there's evidence that the church, uh, let me see how I wrote it here. There's no doubt that there's be, been a de-Christianization of America. The rejection of our historical biblical foundations has allowed an explosion of crime, sexual perversion, destabilization of the family, a carnage and chaos in the culture. Who's to blame? The church. Yeah, Pastor Caldwell, that's kind of hard, but it's the truth. It's not the government's fault. The government was never called, called and assigned to preach the gospel of the world. It's the church's fault. In the kingdom of God, the church is the only one responsible for this assignment to reap the harvest, abundant harvest. God, uh, Jesus said, the harvest is ripe, it's plenteous, it's great, sin laborers. That's, that's just not talking about a few people out of your congregation that want to be missionaries. Everybody is to be doing this, city, state, nation, and world. That's what Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and received the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. He said, you shall be witnesses unto me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth, city, state, nation, and world. And that is the commission of the church. Um, let me back up here. It's not the devil's fault. You say, oh, well, the devil has, has destroyed the church. He can't. It is impossible for the devil to destroy the church. Now, he certainly attacks. He certainly attempts. But listen to what Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16 and verse 18. I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, upon this recognition, this revelation of who I am, Jesus, upon this revelation of who I am, I will build my church. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, this is Jesus' church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's not Satan. The, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The gates of hell, Satan and his demons and all of hell cannot stop the church. So it's not the devil's fault. It's not the government's fault. China, you can be thrown in jail for, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and they take your Bibles. But the underground church in China is, is huge. Huge. Lester Summerall told me right before he died, this, one of his last missions trips was to China. He said they landed, they picked him up at the airport and took him to an undisclosed place where they transferred him to a motorcycle sidecar. Now, can you imagine this? He was in his 80s then. <laughs> he got in a motorcycle sidecar and they carried him out into the middle of the wilderness. They, they, they didn't want anybody to follow him. It was a secret mission. He said, I got out there in the middle of nowhere and there were thousands of people standing and sitting on the ground in the woods waiting to hear him preach. And he said, I asked a few of them, he said, how did you, how did you know there was going to be a meeting out here to, today and that I was coming to preach to you? And they said, he said, were there any announcements, any brochures, any advertising? He said, no, we can't do that. They, they arrest us and put us in jail or kill us. He said, well, how did you know? He said, we pray in the spirit and the Lord tells us. <laughs> well, you know, if the American church depended on that, <clears throat> most people wouldn't know what to do, where to go or when to be there. I mean, you know, we're bombarded with advertising, social media and all kinds of stuff. They simply prayed in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit told them where to go. So it's not the devil's fault that the church is, is diminishing in, in power and authority. It's, it's not the government's 
uh, fault. It's the church's fault. The de-Christianization of America and the rejection of our historic biblical foundations has allowed an explosion of crime, sexual perversion, devastation of the family, carnage and chaos in our culture. Who is to blame? The church. You might as well take it on the chin and and just say, oh me, and repent. Listen to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and let's read uh, verses 13 through 16. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Listen to this. Talking to the church company, talking to his disciples. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Over in Revelation, which we'll eventually read, this is what they're referring to uh, when it talks about the candlestick of each church. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is the responsibility of the church. Now, on tomorrow's program, we're going to talk about, uh, I think, I think, we're going to have one more session on this. Uh, the next time uh, we deal with this, we're going to talk about the five indicators of our downward spiral. I want, to be, want you to be sure and, and tune in uh, the next broadcast. The five indicators of our downward spiral. Now, this is not a negative, a criticism, uh, but this is a, a wake-up call. I mean, we've got to face this, folks. We can't just keep sweeping it under the rugs. We, rug. We've got to do something. The five indicators of our downward spiral, downward spiral of the church and how to fix it. Join me tomorrow. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell.